One of the possibly most confusing passages in the entire New Testament is Jesus cursing a fig tree. Just what is that about? And seemingly, Jesus curses the tree for not having fruit, and it would seem that it would make sense to say, well, grow fruit! But instead he says, never bear fruit again! So it seems completely nonsensical, and it's just there. It's almost like it doesn't even have an attachment to anything. But that's just the appearance of things. There's actually some pretty good explanation to it, and hopefully we'll dig in here and get a better understanding of what this is. There's a lot to explore, and there's actually really way too much to explore. But hopefully we can get a start here to the degree that it makes sense that he curses the tree. Because it really does make sense when you understand the uh, symbolic meanings that are going on here. And so to begin, what we want to do is actually go back to Genesis. And we want to start in Genesis 2. And first I want to cover a little bit in Genesis 2.7. And I'm going to do my best here. And I'm going by an interlinear, and my pronunciation may be terrible. I don't know. I'm not intending to offend anybody. I'm going to do my best here reading the interlinear. Because what I want you to understand is that there's a word play going on here in the original text that doesn't translate into English. And so there's a there's a word play here that would be understood with the original rendering of it in Hebrew. And so when it says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. I'm going to look at this part here that it says from... Um, from man, formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils. That's the portion I want to look at here. From man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils. Okay, so what this is in the Hebrew is Adam Afar Min Adama Nafach Af. And so what I want you to understand is that man is Adam and ground is Adama. So there's a play on words right there, but then man of the dust is Adam Afar, and then the ground and breathed into his nostrils, Adama Nafachaf. So there's a play on words where there's a similar sound to what's being said here, that man formed of the dust and breathes into his nostrils kind of sounds like the same thing. So it's a, it, what would be understood in the original rendering here is that Lord God formed man of the dust and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. It almost sounds like the same thing. That formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life almost sound like the same thing as each other. And so there's a play on words here that's to be understood that when it says man and ground, the the this passage continually says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight, in verse 9. And this is this is out of Adama. And Adam is man. So out of the ground, out of man, there, it's intentionally making a similarity that it's trying to put ground and man together as being symbolically talking about the same thing. And so, trees are representative of people and of systems. And this is the first part to, to get through here, is to understand there's a lot of symbolism here, and there's it, it goes hand in hand with the wordplay that actually exists in the original rendering of it. That there's a wordplay there, but that it also has a symbolic meaning that we can still get out of it in English without having this wordplay, but just when you go back and you read that things are come, made out of the ground, that it sounds similar to saying it's out of man. Um, and then also where you see 
Adam named as like a proper name. In most cases, it's actually the same word as if it just said man. And where it says with woman and with wife, those are both the same word. There's no distinction made whether she's simply woman or whether she's the wife. Just like there's for the most part, no distinction made between whether it's just man or it's a proper name that, as we have rendered it, Adam. And so when you grab on to these kind of ways that there's a play on words, there's puns being used, there's more to understand about the text than, than what has translated directly into English. So that's the first bit there is that Adam, Adam, man, they're all sounding like the same thing. And it also sounds like another word that means red. And we all know that blood is red and blood is the life. And that's not, that's part of, part of the wordplay and the pun that's being uh, included. So we want to go to chapter 2, verse 15. It says, And Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And everybody knows that verse, but I'm just setting that up for what's coming. And in verse 25, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were, uh, they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And again, this could just say, they were both naked, the man and the woman, and and were not ashamed. It's the same word. So we get to chapter 3, and it says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know in the day that ye eat thereof. Then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. So we'll pause there, and we see here that she's talking to the serpent, and he gives her some information, and then she eats some fruit. And if all you do is render it at that face value there without understanding any of the symbolism, you're going to miss the point and probably end up where religion does in this being an act of rebellion or disobedience. And, you know, that for some incoherent reason, God planted a tree in the midst of the garden and told him, don't eat from that one, you know, or I'm going to kill you. Uh... And that's not at all what happened. And in fact, it's talking about how religion makes you afraid of God and makes you feel ashamed of yourself. And that's really what happened. So when we go back, what it is, is that the serpent is a deceitful voice. The tree represents people or a system of so that could be the religious system, or it could be the high priest, for example. So, but the tree is the, relig is the religion. The serpent is the deceitful voice. Fruit is a word. And then the seed is contained in the fruit. It says in chapter 2 that the seed of, every, tr of every, every tree is contained within the fruit. So the seed is contained in the fruit. To eat the fruit means to accept it and to internalize it. It's when, if I say something to you and you go, ah, whatever, that's bullshit. You haven't eaten the fruit. If you go, you know what? I think you might be right. That's eating the fruit. So, when we put that understanding into there, that what happens was that 
God said not to eat of this particular tree, which means don't accept the word that it gives to you. Why? Because there's a deceitful voice in that tree, a serpent. Jesus, all, Jesus would say to the Pharisees and the scribes that they were a generation of vipers. That's saying that they had a deceitful voice. They gave a deceitful word. And so when the serpent spoke to her and she ate, what that's actually saying is that she accepted what was said. So let's go back here to verse 6. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. So what this is actually saying is that they accepted the word that was being spoken to them as sounding like it was good, as sounding like it was wisdom. They thought, you know, that sounds like a good message. I think this guy knows what he's talking about. He's telling us this stuff, and, you know, I think I think we believe him. So that's really what it's saying, that when she ate it, she believed what he said. She internalized it. She accepted it. So this would be like when the priest you know, or the pastor or whoever, you know, the, the crazy street ev evangelist, whatever it is, says, God... Uh, you know, God hates you because you're a filthy sinner or whatever. And you, if you believe that, that's eating the fruit. But that's a deceitful word. So that's serpent. So here's what happens is that the woman is told that God is holding out something on her. And this is an act of fear. This is the serpent saying, God's not on your side. And here's something that you need to do. And she th considers that and thinks... Maybe God's not on my side. Maybe there is something I need to do. And at that point, that's the eating of the fruit. Then she tells her husband and says, here's what we got to do. And he goes, sounds good to me. So this is not an act of F you, God. We can do it on our own. We don't need you. That's not what this is saying. This is saying that they received this deceitful word and internalized it as truth. And that is the eating of the fruit. So now, at this point, it says, their eyes were open, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Later, it says that they were ashamed. It says in verse 10, I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. So, to become ashamed, to become aware, naked is that vulnerability you have. It's any kind of shortcoming, vulnerability, thing that you don't want people to know about, whatever it is, like, uh, for example, in um, with the story of Noah, the one son goes in and he comes back out and he says he's drunk and naked. So he came out and he gossiped to the world that what his state was. He, he broadcast the vulnerability of Noah. The other two went in. They went in backwards. They refused to look upon what the situation was. They refused to acknowledge it. And then they covered him over with a blanket. And so what this is saying is that would be the equivalent of somebody saying, you know, Harry fell off the wagon again. And you'd say, you don't know what you're talking. Uh, if you said, I don't know what you're talking about and neither do you. So shut up and mind your own business. That's the two backing up backwards and covering with a blanket. It's refusing to acknowledge that nakedness. And at the same time, it's not sexual. It has nothing to do with sex. It has to do with whether you are broadcasting people's vulnerabilities or whether you're refusing to acknowledge it. So here they are. Now they've acknowledged their own shortcomings, their own nakedness, their own vulnerabilities. And so what they do is sew fig leaves together. Leaves are religious works. So what they did was tried to cover what they thought was their shortcoming with religious works. So now we get to verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. So here's where religion starts to get really nasty with this. Because now God is the great accuser. And... I'm going to read this one way and then another. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you? That's how religion tells you it says. And the Lord God called unto Adam and then said unto him, Where are you? 
And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Right? Religion's reading. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree whereof I commanded you should not eat? No. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded you that thou should not eat? And the man said, The woman thou gavest me to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. I want to stop there. The serpent is told that he'll eat dust all the days of his life. In verse 19, talking to Adam, For dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. The deceitful voice will eat men. And that's what's being said here. The deceitful voice will consume men. And it also says, I don't want to go through the whole entire thing here, but it says uh, here, unto Adam he said, verse 17, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife and hast eaten of the tree which I commanded thee, saying, thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. Now remember, ground sounds like man. Right? There's a similarity between Adama and Adam. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust thou shalt return. And so, this is talking, this ties in well with the parable of the sower, which we're going to skip for today. But, the thorns and thistles are brought forth. So you have a serpent with a deceitful word. You accept that and internalize it. That's eating of the fruit. Now that seed which is contained within the fruit is sown in your heart. And what it yields, your heart is that ground. And what it yields from eating that fruit, that fruit from religion, that fruit from the deceitful voice from religion, is that it yields thorns and thistles. And it tells you, that what you're going to do is you're going to live a life that is hard, laborious, difficult. And that's what is being uh, conveyed here, is that by eating this fruit, this is what your life is going to be like. Because you've eaten of this fruit that says that God is withholding from something from you, and there's something you must do. Because that's what's actually being conveyed here. Is God is not on your side. You're on your own. Good luck. And what that's going to yield, that's going to yield a life of feeling like life is hard. It's going to yield hardship. It's going to yield a sense of laboriousness. It's going to cause you to li you know, live the rat race. This constant treadmill of never attaining and always seeking. And so then it says in verse 21, Unto Adam also and his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothed them. And so they tried to cover themselves with religious works, and God said, you don't need that. Here, if you really feel like you have shortcomings, let me take care of it. I will cover you. I will stand in the way of the accusation that says that there's something wrong with you, that you have a shortcoming, that you have nakedness. I will cover you. I will stand in that way. I will be your fortress. That's what this is saying. And so then in verse 22, I'm just going to include this so that we can destroy this stupid idea that religion tells you that this part was a lie. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become as one of us to know good and evil. Okay, so there was no lie that you were going to become as gods, knowing good and evil, because there it is. The text says that happened. That wasn't a lie. Okay, so let's just dispense with that and throw that, flush that down the toilet. That's not one of the serpent's lies. 
whether that's good or whether that's something that one would want to have is questionable. Is knowing good and evil something worth having? Because what that is, that's losing your innocence. That's a fall from innocence. It's not a rebellion against God. It's a fall from innocence. It's that moment in time at which you say, if God loves me, why is this so? And when you seek the answer, someone says, because you haven't done this. And so here's what you need to do to correct that situation. And then, you, then God will love you again. That's what this is describing. A fall from innocence in which at some point something triggered a wondering of why is this so if God really loves me and the religious man said here's what you can do to get God to love you again that's a fall from innocence God is not naive therefore you have become like God no longer being naive no longer having that innocence so that's what's actually going on in the garden now, I made a lot of assertions about fruit and trees and leaves and all that stuff, so I want to at least do some amount of looking into other passages to show this correlation. You know, to, to show that I'm not just saying people are trees or that fruit is words. Uh, so let's look at a few passages, and hopefully it's not way too many. But first, we're going to start in Judges chapter 9. And there's a parable that's spoken here starting in verse 7. And so, there's a parable told here about trees seeking a king. And I'm not going to do too much to explore the meaning of the parable, but just to show that this is a parable where trees represent people. So it says, And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood up on top of Mount Gerizim, and lifted up his voice and cried, and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. The trees went forth. So here it just, it just shifted from ye men of Shechem. It says the trees went forth. So this is the beginning of a parable, and trees are representing people. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them, and they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man and go to be promoted over the trees? And the trees said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruit and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said the trees to the vine, Come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine which cheereth God and man and go be promoted over the trees? Then said trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto the trees, If in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. So, in brief, they went to the olive tree, the fig tree, and to the vine. And they all said, Look, I have no desire to be elevated above the rest of you. And only the bramble had any amount of agreement to be their king, which is the thorns, the thistles. And it said, you know what? You want me to be king? You, you get over here. You do it my way. And if not, let fire come out and devour you. So he says, you do it my way or the highway if you want me to be your king. All the other trees were just. They said, we're equal to you. We're no better than you. We refuse to reign over you. But the bramble said, you want me to reign over you? I will reign over you like a tyrant. So there it is. That's religion. And that's all I'm going to do on looking over that. Psalms 1-3, it says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water that bring forth his fruit in season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. This all ties in also ties in the leaf here, with the leaf being works. The leaf is whatsoever he doeth. So this is a leaf that shall not wither, because whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. It's the same thing. It's repeating the same principle. But here it is, the man that walks not in the council, etc. It's a 
well-known passage. He shall be like a tree. A man shall be like a tree is what it says. In Proverbs chapter 13, A man shall eat good by the fruit of his mouth, but the soul of the transgressor shall eat violence. So here it is, the fruit of his mouth. So that means words. We're going to go to Proverbs 11.30. And it says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. So this is interesting, too, because there was a tree of life that they weren't, that, or <laughs> there was also in the midst of, the, not that they weren't supposed to eat from. There was also in the midst of the garden, there was a tree of life. What is the tree of life? It is the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. And it says, and he that evangelizes and gets people to make a confession of faith is wise. Wait, that's not... It says, He that winneth souls is wise. Maybe I've misunderstood... Maybe people have misunderstood what winneth souls means. Because I don't think that it's saying to make a confession. Maybe there's something that's going to come later that might explain that a little bit better. I don't know. There might be a reference here that explains it further and better then go get confessions of faith. I'll leave it at that. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 20. A man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth, and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Verse 21, well known. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. That is very well known. Here we go. This is following the wildly misused My Thoughts Are Higher Than Your Thoughts passage here in Isaiah 55, starting at verse 10. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returns not thither, but watereth the earth, and maketh it to bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater. That sounds like a familiar passage. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. For ye shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you into singing, and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorns shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree, and it shall be to the Lord for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Sounds pretty good to me. And it sounds like I don't get a vote. But it sounds like it's not a problem that I don't get a vote. Um, so, here we see in verse 12 that the trees of the field shall clap their hands. So, you know, either trees develop a, uh, an ability to grow hands and start clapping, or there's something symbolic about this language, and maybe trees represent people. And maybe there are people which do have hands clapping their hands. And <laughs> so maybe this is telling us that people and trees have a symbolic correlation to one another. I also want to note here that the word shall not return to him void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper. There's no failure there. Zero percent failure rate. It shall be to the Lord for a name for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Period. End of sentence. Not cut off. Isaiah chapter 61, which we covered how Jesus took the vengeance portion out in Luke 4, and he was very disliked for taking vengeance away from God. But we see here that it says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, 
the planting of the Lord that he might be glorified. So here it is that they might be called trees of righteousness. Who's called trees of righteousness? Well, if we go back, the people that are preached to, the meek, the brokenhearted, the captives, them that are bound, those who mourn. Sound anything like the opening of the Sermon on the Mount, by the way? Um, so who though they might be called trees of righteousness. Those are those people called trees of righteousness. And so we continue, just because I want to show some stuff here about what it says about what kind of person God is. And they shall build the old wastes. They shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolation of many generations. And strangers shall stand and feed your flocks, and the sons of the aliens shall be your plowmen, your vine dressers. But ye shall be named the priests of the Lord. Men shall call you the ministers of our God. Ye shall eat the riches of the Gentiles, and in their glory shall ye boast yourselves. For your shame ye have double, and for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. And then this is great. For I, the Lord, love judgment. I hate robbery for burnt offering. I will direct their work in truth, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. And their seed shall be known among the Gentiles, and their offspring among the people. All that see them shall acknowledge them, that they are the seed which the Lord hath blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with her jewels. For as the earth bring forth her bud, and as the garden causeth the things that are sown into it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. And so even that, where it says, He hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. That is God with the cloak of skins, the covering of skins with man and woman that ate from that tree of religion, that made accusation that they had shortcomings. And God says, I will clothe you. I will protect you from that accusation. God is not your accuser. Devil means accuser. If you have a God who's an accuser, you have a God who's the devil. Or you have a devil who has become God. Whichever way, doesn't matter. Ezekiel chapter 47. And we start in verse 6. And he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river. Now I, when I had returned, behold, at the bank of the river there were very many trees, on the one side and on the other. Then said he unto me, These waters issue out of the east country, and go down into the desert, and go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the waters shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that everything that liveth, which moveth whithersoever the river shall come, shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of fish, because these waters shall come thither. For they shall be healed, and everything which live whither the river cometh. And it shall come to pass that the fishers shall stand upon it from Engedi even unto Eglaim. They shall be a place to spread forth nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as the fish of the great sea exceeding many. But the miry places thereof and the marishes thereof shall not be healed. They shall be given to salt. I think I went too far. I think, <laughs> Yeah, I wanted to stop at verse 9, apparently. Um, missed my notes here. Um, so here it is. It's talking about a river that comes out and its waters are healing. But it says about the trees on the one side and on the other and the waters issue towards the east country and down into the desert. There's a lot of symbolism here. The desert is the dry place. It's the place that, that needs this uh, renewing of the word. So that's the desert place, and into the sea, which is the nations. And so, into the sea, and then the waters shall be healed. So it's talking about these trees on the side of the river, and it shall be healed. And this is what is captured in Revelation chapter 22. This is the same symbolism, the same imagery. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. 
In the midst of the street of it, and on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the tree, leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve them, serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. And they shall reign for ever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show his unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Um, so this tells you that this river flows from the throne of God and the Lamb. Now the throne of God is the cross. Um, I may or may not be correct in the analysis that the river is, is the blood. But the throne is definitely the cross. So this river of water of life proceeds from the cross. Now it says on either side of the tree was a tree of life. This means that the people who have, who have taken in this message have themselves become trees of life. This is why there's a tree of life on either side. And it says, which bear twelve manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. This, that's what this is telling you, is that the twelve manner of fruits and yielding the fruit every month is saying that those who have heard this message and those who have put on this message have now become the tree of life for others. And there shall be no more curse, which means no more law, but the throne of the God, sh uh, throne of God, and the Lamb shall be in it. And it says, "They shall see His face," which means that you're face to face with God. There's no separation. That's what that means. There's no separation, and His name shall be in their foreheads, which means that they have the mind of Christ. Okay, it it doesn't mean that you have a tattoo on your forehead. It means that you have the mind of Christ. So you have no separation and you have the mind of Christ. And there shall be no night there because there's no darkness. It doesn't mean there's no cycle of day and night. It means that you don't have darkness. You're not walking in darkness. There's no veil over your mind. You have the mind of Christ. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. So that's saying that when you have the mind of Christ, you're no longer walking in the, in the darkness. There is no night. It's symbolic. It doesn't mean that, you know, you die and go to planet third heaven and, and it's only ever daytime. That that would be horrible, actually. I would love to look at the stars. Um, so, I don't know. That That's either a really s s demoralizing verse that makes me second guess whether, you know, that even sounds appealing, or it's symbolic. I'm going to vote that it's symbolic. Because otherwise it makes me, gives me hesitation. Really? It's never nighttime. I think that would suck. <laughs> that goes hand in hand with the there's no sea. Wow, cool. That's so we can't go fishing on a boat and go surfing or any of that stuff anymore? Is there snow? Like What, what else is missing from our wondrous creation that we don't get to have anymore? You know, this is symbolic. This is not saying these things don't exist. Um, I don't want to get sidetracked there. So we go to Galatians because I want to talk about the fruit. Is The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. So that's Galatians 5, 22 to 23. So that's the fruit that yields... That's the fruit that yields for healing. That's the fruit of righteousness right there. It's the fruit of the Spirit in this passage, but that's essentially the same thing. It ties together. It's at least in harmony with the fruit of righteousness. And the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. So the fruit of the Spirit, the seed is always contained within the fruit. The, the heart is the ground. The heart is the soil in which it's sown. So when you internalize that, when you accept it and internalize it and you eat of that fruit, when you eat of love, when you eat of joy, when you eat of peace, that seed is planted in your heart and the seed yields its own kind. So whatever is going, what's going to grow back out of that heart that you've accepted that fruit, that's, it's going to grow out, it's going to yield more fruit. 
So you're going to have fresh fruit coming out from having eaten this fruit yourself. That's the cycle that's being shown here, is that when you internalize the fruit, it comes back out of you. When you internalize the fruit, it comes back out of you. The, the process is always one of inward to outward, never one of outward to inward. It starts inward, it moves outward. You become the river of living water. You become the, the branch that yields fruit. But you do that by eating the, of the fruit yourself. So now we get to James 3.18, which I made a comment about. And the fruit of righteousness is sown, of pe sown in peace of them that make peace. So the fruit of righteousness, according to James chapter 3, is to make peace. It is sown in peace of them that make peace. I don't know what that could possibly have to do with getting confessions of faith. Anyway. So now we're going to finally get to this passage in Mark having to do with the tree that was cursed. So we're going to tie all this together that Adam and Eve ate from a tree of religion that made them feel ashamed and afraid of God. And that's how you know when you've eaten from the wrong tree. If you feel ashamed and afraid of God, you've eaten from the wrong tree. I love that as a little little motto or reminder to just briefly state how you know when you've gone wrong. When you feel ashamed and afraid of God, you've eaten from the wrong tree. There it is. It's that simple. And what they did, they tried to cover their shame with leaves of the tree, which was a fig tree. So they covered themselves with the fig leaves. Those are religious works. Fig leaves are religious works. So now we're going to get to this passage where Jesus sees a fig tree that only has leaves but no fruit. What did we just discuss about what this fruit that he's looking for is? Well, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace to them who make peace, and the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, meekness, temperance. I don't even remember the whole list off the top of my head. So we'll start in Mark and go to Mark 11, starting in chapter or verse 1, rather. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethphage, I guess, and Bethany, at the Mount of Olives, he sent forth two of his disciples and saith to them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon no man ever sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man... Am I reading the right chapter? I think some... Ah, that's what the problem was. I... Uh, I just started too early in the chapter. So anyway, we get to verse 12. I just started in the wrong plot, wrong place. Uh, and sorry about that. And on the morrow, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever and his disciples heard it so there it is that's that sounds really weird you know he sees a tree it doesn't have any fruit and then he says don't ever have fruit again like if he's jesus why didn't he speak life to it why didn't he go bring forth fruit now you know and then they'd be having a feast you know, why, why couldn't it be like the, the feeding of the 5,000? Why, why not just expand, bring, bring provision that isn't out of some nowhere? Well, because the tree means something. The tree has a sim symbolism to it. This isn't a, really about being hungry. This is about seeing the tree of religion and seeing that it has religious works, but it has no fruit of righteousness. It has no fruit of the Spirit. So then we see this sandwich structure that I mentioned before. Because it's going to do a little aside, which seems unrelated, but is actually very related. And then it's going to go back to the fig tree. So in verse 15 it says, And they come to Jerusalem, and Jesus went into the temple, and began to cast out them that sold and bought in the temple, and overthrew the tables of the money changers, and the seats of them that sold doves, and would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, is it not written, My house shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves? 
And the scribes and chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him, for they feared him, because all the people was astonished at his doctrine. And when even was come, he went out of the city. So this is interesting, that Jesus goes into the temple, and he's not happy with the kind of thing he sees going on at the temple. Because what he sees are the poor being taken advantage of, instead of seeing a place where the poor can go and seek help, he sees poor being taken advantage of. This ties in with the fact that the religious works are not consistent with the fruit of the Spirit. There are leaves, religious works, but no fruit of the Spirit, no kindness, no comforting of the grieving, no opening the eyes of the blind. There's making of religious sacrifice and religious ritual. But there's nothing that is helping people. There's no love for one another. So then we get to verse 20. And in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Well, that's the death of the law. And Peter calling to remembrance saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. Well, that seems like a really weird response. That he curses a tree, and the guy, and Peter's astonished, Wow, the, the tree's actually dead. And Jesus says, Have faith in God? How does this make sense? Well, it makes sense when you understand that the fig tree is religion. And that when Jesus said, You're not going to bring forth fruit anymore. You're dead, religion. You're dead, law of Moses. That it actually worked. The trick worked. And so what does he say? Have faith in God. Why? Because if you go back, the whole thing was to not have faith in God. The whole thing was that was brought on by a feeling that God does not have your back, that God is not supportive of you, that God is not your provider, that God is not your protector, that God is not your healer, and that there's something that you have to do, religious works, leaves on the fig tree, covering your nakedness, but instead have faith in God. Understand that he holds nothing against you, that he will cover you. He will protect you from that accusation. He is your provider. Have faith in God, and what does that do? It kills that religious tree. That's what he's saying. It makes sense when you understand that the tree is religion, and the tree is accusation, and the tree is what tells you with the deceitful serpent's voice that there's something that you must do to make yourself right with God. So he says, have faith in God. And this is great because it follows it up with something that just even further pushes this boundary. Because he says, For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe those things which he saith come to pass, he shall have whatever he saith. So what this, this is about the, the by faith casting the mountain into the tree. Well, what is that mountain? That mountain is Sinai. That mountain is the law. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18, For ye are not come into the mount that might, not, might be touched, and that burned with fire, nor unto blackness and darkness and tempest. Verse 22, But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to the innumerable company of angels. It says ye are come to the heavenly Jerusalem. It's here. So... Here it is. It's saying that that mount is Sion. That means the law. Okay? The, the law was the thing that scared you. The law was the thing that burned with fire. The law was the thing that said, come, come under my shadow or let fire burn you up like the cedars of Lebanon. That's the law. That's fear. That's telling you, you do it my way or you suffer the consequences. That's not God saying, you know, look, if you really feel like you need it, I will clothe you. It's totally the opposite. They, they, don't, they don't go together. Law and grace don't fit. They just don't at all. So now we establish that he says, By faith you cast this mountain into the sea. That mountain is Sion, which means the law. So here we go. Revelation, uh, in Revelation chapter 8, verse 8, 
And it says, And the second angel sounded, and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea. A mountain burning with fire is Sinai. A mountain burning with fire is the law. It's cast into the sea by faith. When you have that faith, that is the end of the law. So we go to Romans chapter 10. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth.